Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Exodus. In chapter 3, this is Moses at the burning bush, verses 1 through 4. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. May God add blessing to the reading and the understanding of the scripture. You're invited to stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Again, from the midpoint of the gospel according to Mark, uh, this is after the transfiguration that we read about last week, where Jesus was on top of the mountain with James and John and Peter and was transfigured. And now uh, we're at chapter 9, verses 33 through 37, and the discussion between the disciples about who is the greatest. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I know that some of you who are worshiping today, some of you were in debate in high school or college. I'm going to guess some of you were award-winning debaters in high school or college. And congratulations for that. For those of us who weren't in formal debate, I'll bet you the people around us, our spouses or our partners or our colleagues or our friends, might tell us that while not formal, some of us are gifted at debate. Maybe what I'm really talking about is more informally, we're great at arguing. Some of us are just gifted at arguing. And, and I don't have to look far to find people who would tell you that I'm that. And I'm guessing there are people who would tell me that maybe about you. We are human. And at least part of the time, we think we're right when others disagree with us. And sometimes we can become quite passionate and intense, and other times it sort of really doesn't matter. But, but arguing is a part of our lives now. We're also people of faith. That's what we claim to be. Does arguing fit into that? Well, there's really only one place to look, and, and that's to the Scriptures. And we have great examples of great arguers in the scriptures today. You remember with me, we started the story of Moses last week with the two Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, and their decision to, to choose faith rather than fear and, and to stand against the king of Egypt and, and not to kill the, the infant baby boys when they were born, but instead to let them live. And, and as we know, the, the king was not stopped by that. He then put out an edict that all male children under the age of two should be put to death. And we know that Moses' mother and sister make a, a basket of reeds and put him in the Nile and, and that the king's daughter, the princess, finds him and decides to save him and brings him into the palace and he grows up in the palace and, and what we know is he has this crisis of identity because he's Hebrew but he's living in the Egyptian palace and, and he sees a, a slave master treating the Hebrew slaves unfairly and he kills him and then he runs for his life and then he finds a woman and he gets married and he joins his father-in-law's business and they live happily ever after. Amen. But then God. But then God appears. See, that's, that's really not supposed to be the way it happens, at least the way we understand fairy tales in, in human life. When we go to see movies, we, we don't want to, there to be a, a questionable ending, right? We, we want to go there to feel good, to be entertained, and, and that's fine with the movies. But friends, when we try to place that structure around the scriptures, we miss a whole lot of God. 
Uh, This dramatic story of Moses only begins when we think cinematically it probably should end. And Moses is part of that. He's keeping the sheep of his father-in-law and and he's out on the hillside one day and he sees a bush that's not being consumed. It's on fire, but it's not being consumed. And so he walks over to see and it says, and when God saw that Moses turned aside to see this thing that was happening, that's when God said, Moses, Moses, calling to him. And Moses says, here I am. Poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote a, 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 poet, a poetic novel. By the way, I'm sure it's classically great. And for people who get it, they really enjoy it. Um, I had to read it. And I'm not going to claim that I enjoyed it. But in the middle of that very long free verse poem that is a novel, she writes this. Earth is crammed with heaven. And every common bush of fire with God. But only he who turns to see takes off his shoes. The others just sit around and pluck blackberries. I love that. A part of what we talked about last week in deciding what's truly important in deciding how then we should live, a, a part of that was a willingness to open ourselves to the unexpected, to the, to the extraordinary we might find in the ordinary, and that, and that if we focus on God first, if we focus on Jesus first, if we understand who Jesus is, then that causes us to see the world differently, even in ordinary times, or perhaps most especially during ordinary times. Moses is living now an ordinary life. He's no longer a Hebrew living in the middle of an Egyptian palace. He's no longer dealing with this crisis of identity. He's, he's killed this Egyptian tax, taskmaster, and, and we might say even then that was an act of justice, and he's run for his life, and now, now he's done. Perhaps he's advocated for God's people in the most intense way possible, and now he gets what? Now he gets the benefit of the doubt. He just gets to spend the rest of his life living as an ordinary guy in an ordinary marriage with an ordinary father-in-law who has enough flocks to employ him. And then there is that bush. And it says only when he turns aside to see this bush that is burning and not being consumed does God's voice then call out to him, Moses, Moses. So... So are we willing to turn aside and see? (laughs) Are we willing to to decide that God and Jesus Christ is what's truly important in our lives and to allow that to shape then how we are open to those things that call to us in the world that may seem to everyone else like a blackberry bush to be plucked, but to others, they see a common bush of fire with God. But then guess what? It's all marvelous and wonderful. And then guess what? Moses starts arguing with none other than God. It won't be the last time, but it is the first time. So God calls Moses and then God says, you know, what I really need you to do is I need you to go to the Egyptian king and I need you to tell him that God is ready for God's people to be set free. And Moses says, um, who am I? that you would send me. And God says, you're Moses, but what makes you able to do this is that I will be with you. My presence will be with you. Okay, one argument. And then Moses says, okay, so you're sending me and I'm to tell the Israelites that their God is sending me, but what is your name? What, what, what am I supposed to tell them about what your name is? And God says, in, in one of the most famous lines God has, Tell them I am has sent you. I mean, it would have been easier if God would have said, well, tell them Jack is sending you or tell them Susan is sending you or tell them, but tell them I am is sending you. I am who I am. I I will be who I will be. And then he gets a little more specific and God says, tell them that the God of their forefathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent you. So argument two. Argument three. What if they don't believe me? Right? I mean, 
They know that he grew up in the Egyptian palace. How do they know he hasn't been sort of warped by that? How does he know he's not sort of coming to them, trying to trick them for the king of Egypt's sake? What, what do I do if they don't believe me? And, and God says, see that staff in your hand? Throw it on the ground. And so Moses throws it on the ground. It becomes a snake. And then God says, pick it up again. And it's a good thing it wasn't me because I ain't touching no snake. I'm not even sure if the voice of God could make me touch a snake. But Moses grabs the snake and it becomes a staff again. And then God says, put your hand inside your cloak. Regular, ordinary hand. Moses puts it inside his cloak. He brings it out again. It's full of leprosy. God says, put your hand back in your cloak. Moses puts it back in his cloak. He brings it out again and it's healthy. God says, this is my power, Moses. That's argument three. Argument four, I love. Moses says, I'm not eloquent. Okay, is someone who's not eloquent use the word eloquent? I mean, I'm just asking, right? That's the word translated from the Hebrew. I'm not eloquent. And God had to been like, seriously, why, why didn't you choose a different word than that? Because I know you are then. And, and Moses says, I'm slow of, of speech and tongue. And God says, I will give you the words. You won't have to come up with them yourself. Argument four. Then finally, Moses says, find somebody else. I mean, I'm not even kidding. In the fourth chapter, Moses says to God, can't you just find somebody else? Can't you just send somebody else? And it says that God's anger is kindled because why wouldn't it be? How frustrated must God be at this point? You see, here's the deal. We think these great pillars of the faith, I mean, Moses ranks up there with Abraham and Sarah. As, as, a part of the, as a part of the very foundation of who we are, the scriptures will say there, was, there came no greater leader to the people of God than Moses. Those, there are those who would say Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. In essence, he more lived them, but, but that's how great Moses is. And so we think that these pillars of the faith, probably when God called them, it's like, whoa, there's a, there's a choir of angels and they just said, yes. Yes, Lord, I'm with you. Of course, that's why you called me. Because my faith is all put together. Because I have no doubts. Because I'm not filled with anxiety. Because I'll never argue with me that I shouldn't have to do this for you. Because I had my life all worked out. But no, Moses argues with God. And friends, we, get, we, we have to give him a T for tenacity, right? I mean, they may have not have been the best debate points in the world, but you got to give him a T for tenacity. God answers everyone, and he just takes God to God's very edge. It says God gets angry and says, look, I will send your brother Aaron with you. And I will give my words to you, and you will give them to Aaron, and Aaron can speak them. Now, God may regret that later. We'll see that next week. But what does it mean that God calls human beings, not superhumans, not superheroes. We're living in ordinary time in the liturgical year. Not not Advent where the angel comes to Mary. Not Lent where we watch as Jesus marches stalwartly toward the cross. We're in ordinary time. God calls ordinary human beings in those ordinary times as we are willing to focus on our faith and allow our faith to help us see that the earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only he who turns aside to see takes off his shoes. Everyone else sits around and plucks blackberries. Do you want to see? Do we want to see with the eyes of faith? Jesus is spending an ordinary time with his disciples. He's not healing anybody. He's not feeding 5,000 people. He's, he's not walking on water in our scripture today. He's walking through Galilee on their way to Capernaum with the disciples. And he doesn't seem to even be teaching at the time. And so he's told the disciples more than once, 
He's told the disciples, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be killed, and on the third day I'll rise again. And the, the scripture says that the disciples didn't understand it, but they were afraid to ask him about it. So instead they start arguing, right? Because if there's a reality in our relationships, if there's a reality in our world, if there's a reality in our workplace that we don't want to see or deal with, what's a great way to deflect our attention away from the reality? Arguing. Arguing. It takes up all our energy. Arguing. It takes our focus. Arguing. It keeps us from making any strides towards resolving the challenge of the reality in front of us. And what do they argue about? Which one of them is the greatest? And we think to ourselves, oh, good, good deal, because we, would, we don't have the ego strength to argue about that with our colleagues, right? We don't stand around, we don't stand around the water cooler or wherever it is you stand in, in your workplace. We don't stand around shooting the breeze and saying, you know, I'm greater than you. <laughs> And then our colleague says, no, really, I'm greater than you. We don't, we don't do that. So we're left out of this story. But let's wait, 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 wait. What, what, what are, what's the heart of the argument about mask wearing or freedom from mask wearing? It's a very passionate argument for everyone on every side. And what are we really arguing about? Aren't we arguing about who's more Right? In other words, aren't we arguing about who has the greatest understanding of what's really going on? Aren't we arguing a little bit about who's the greatest in analyzing the situation? Oh, well, okay, we're, we're tired of hearing about the pandemic. We're tired of hearing about masks. How about, let's go to a non-controversial, well, maybe not quite non-controversial, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter thing. What are we arguing about when we say black lives matter and then other people say all lives matter and then other people say blue lives matter? Are we arguing about who's most right? Who has the greatest understanding of race relations? Who has the greatest understanding of how it is that we live together in this nation? Are we arguing about who has the greatest finger on the pulse of what should be happening? And as long as we argue about it, we don't actually really have to change anything. Shall I go on? Shall I go on to all the hot button topics and, and sift it down for us to say that at the heart of it, sometimes it's about which one of us has the greatest understanding? And we all have opinions about it. And the Bible has opinions about it. Because at the heart of the Bible is a desire for justice. And this is how I know that. So you know what Jesus does? He, he, they get to Capernaum and Jesus says, what are y'all talking about on, on the road here? And just like human beings, they are silent. Who broke the lamp? Who decided to play ball in the house when we told you not to? Jesus knows. So he says, you know, the one who wants to be the greatest must be the least of all and the servant of all. And it says he calls the disciples together. Okay, here is what I want you to hear. He calls the disciples together. He doesn't say, those of you who are arguing, you need to sit over here. Those of you who are watching the argument, you need to sit over here. Those of you who are right, sit over here. Those of you who are wrong, sit over here. Those of you who know what justice is about, sit over here. Those of you who don't know what justice is about, sit over here. He doesn't do that. He calls them together. And then he refuses to get enmeshed in their argument. I hate it when that happens. He refuses to get, to get triangled in. And do you know what he does? He does something totally unexpected. He sees a child and he puts a child in the midst of them. A child. He puts a child in the midst of them. Children in that day and time were not only, not supposed, to, were not only supposed to be seen and not heard, it would even be better if they weren't seen. They, they, 
because children, you never knew quite if they were going to live much past birth or much past toddlerhood or much past, they were a commodity. Jesus takes a child. Later, the disciples will be like, take those children away from Jesus. He doesn't need to be bothered with them. And he'll say, no, let them come to me. He takes a child. He puts them right in the midst of them. This is the children's sermon. He puts the child right into their midst after he's called them together. And then it says he takes the child in his arms. He doesn't know where this child has been. He doesn't know if this child is the child of an unwed mother. Maybe like his own. He doesn't know if this is a child of a, of a woman caught in adultery. He doesn't know if this is a child of persons with disabilities. He takes the child in his arms and he says, anyone who welcomes one such child like this welcomes me and anyone who welcomes a child like this doesn't just welcome me but welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus' argument about their argument, Jesus' resolution about their argument is not that they should stop arguing. He knows us better than that. Jesus knows we are not going to stop arguing with one another. We are not going to stop being passionate about what we believe to be the case. And what he says is, it's the spirit with which you live in the midst of that arguing that makes a difference. He changes the tone. He changes the context. He says, look, if you can welcome each other as I'm welcoming this child, go ahead and have your argument. But if you love each other and respect each other while you're arguing, it might change the whole scope of how things get worked out. I think the Bible is pretty clear on justice issues for race and class and age. I think the Bible is pretty clear about how we are to behave and what the, and what the expectations are. And before all of that, I think underneath our, our work for justice for the most vulnerable among us, is the heart that goes into how we live and make decisions together. And here's what I know. It's impossible for human beings not to allow enmity to rise in us against the people who disagree with us, especially about topics that we believe are most important. And what Jesus is saying is, I can't stop you from arguing about those things. I can't stop you from knowing who you believe are wrong and who you believe are right. I can tell you that as people of faith, the first thing you have to do is welcome who the person is that you see as least valuable. And if you can have a heart of authentic welcome for the person you see as least valuable in the midst of your arguments, then it will change the tone of how you live with people with whom you disagree. I think that's what faith does. I think it transforms how we see each other and how we see the world. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, wherever you are, I'm sorry. I I, I don't ever want to read Aurora Lee again. But thank you. Because all the earth is crammed with heaven. And every common bush afire with God. But only the one who sees takes off their shoes. Everyone else sits around and plucks blackberries. How then shall we live? Let's choose faith. Amen.